I'm Spencer Levy, and this is The Weekly Take. We interrupt our regular scheduled programming for a story of disruption. A real estate outsider from the music world offers his unique perspective on doing business in an industry forced to make big changes. Sound like any line of work you know? On this episode, a self-professed rock onomist, rock economist, that is, on business evolution, innovation, and more. We stared into the abyss, spent 10 years making matters worse, pivoted, and spent the next 10 years making matters better than ever before. And I think so many other businesses now are staring at their own next moment. That's Will Page joining us from London. Will is best known as the former chief economist at Spotify, but he studied and worked in the music business for more than 20 years, dating back to when compact discs were the popular standard. This year, he mined that experience in a new book called Tarzan Economics, Eight Principles for Pivoting Through Disruption. We'll talk about those ideas, lessons of a time when digital piracy endangered an industry's entire business model. We'll hear about what he saw on the front lines of the streaming revolution and how that can apply to the future of commercial real estate or any line of work. So sit back and enjoy the show. We're rocking business disruption with rockonomist and author Will Page. That's right now on The Weekly Take. Welcome to The Weekly Take. Will, thank you for joining the show. Thanks. Thanks big time for getting me on. Pleasure to be here. Delighted to have you, Will. We got you here today, Will, because a lot of people are talking about our sector more than others, commercial real estate, and how it's been disrupted by COVID-19 and how your book, Tarzan Economics, talks about how the music industry sort of set the tone for disruption 20 plus years ago. Tell us a little bit about that. Let's go back 20 years. So 20 years ago, I was finishing university in Glasgow and I woke up one morning, went to the computer labs because nobody had laptops then. And everybody was staring at something called Winamp. In America, it would have been Napster, essentially illegal file sharing sites, which allowed you to get all the music you wanted for free. Now, from a business model perspective, let's think about the music industry for a second. It's built on something called copyright. And there's some wordplay here because copyright stands for the right to control copying. What happens to your business when you lose that right to control copying because of something called Napster comes along? And that sent the music industry into a tailspin. They spent millions on litigation, suing consumers, suing websites, suing ISPs, internet service providers, and they lost billions in revenue halved in size. And that was the first 10 years of a reaction to disruption was to fight change. You know, if we fight change, the kids will go back to buying CDs in the shop. If we fight change, the internet will be cleaned up and policed, just like the record shop has a security guard outside forcing you to pay. And what happened was we let go of that old vine. This is where the analogy of Tarzan kicked in. That old vine that was holding the business up off the jungle floor They let go of that business model and reached out to this new vine called streaming, which we're all accustomed to now, which was to embrace change. And 10 years on, 20 years since Napster, music industry is now showing a recovery that everyone is envious of. Instead of being the laughingstock of the business, we're the golden child of disruption. We're the ones that you can learn from. And that's the interesting story. We stared into the abyss, spent 10 years making matters worse, pivoted, and spent the next 10 years making matters better than ever before. And I think so many other businesses now are staring at their own Napster moment. Now, the point here is for the consumer, in 20 years, not a lot has changed. 20 years ago, they went to the internet and got any song they wanted from Napster. Now they go to Spotify, pay £120 a year and get any song they want too. So it's the interesting analogy of instead of fighting change, embrace it, work with the consumer, not against the consumer. And when I look at your sector and I see the shift e-commerce, I can already start seeing some tension there about, Will the consumers start going back to the high street? Can we get back to where we came from? That's the old vine. And you can't hold on to that old vine forever. Soon, that old vine is going to let go of you. At some point, you're going to have to make the leap to a new way of doing business, a new way of thinking about the problem. Well, in your book, you obviously focus on the music industry and the happy ending for the music industry, how today it is finally growing again after perhaps a decade of really shrinking because of streaming. Um, But not every industry has a happy ending. Um, I would look at the taxi cab industry and Uber. If somebody bought a taxi cab license known as a medallion in New York City, uh, they had a reasonable expectation, I think, that they would have a sort of monopoly on the ability to pick up rides. But Uber came in and changed that. Do you see a happy ending 
for all industries that choose to jump to the next vine. And how are these laws like medallions or, in the case of music industry, copyright or in the case of Bitcoin, regulation of money? Are these just laws to be changed by the next innovator? Okay, let's stick with taxis for a second. Here in the UK, for example, the black cab drivers, the traditional incumbent taxi drivers, if you are, refused to take credit card payments for decades. That signal was there from the consumer, which is, I want to get into a cab, not pull over to a cash machine, not carry cash in my pocket, and just pay with a card. And I would say for 30 years, black cab drivers refused to embrace that change. They preferred a cash economy, and they wouldn't take car payments. Now, they were fighting change, and Uber saw that as an opportunity. <laughs> it's all taken care of through the app on your phone. You don't have to enter your credit card details on every ride. Made it easier to pay. And by making it easier to pay, more people took Ubers and more people paid for their trips. What's happened in response? I mean, is it a happy ending or an unhappy ending? The black cab drivers now have hybrid taxis, which are like a hovercraft. They make no noise. They've got a clear roof, air conditioned, far better conditioning than an Uber car. And they take car payments and they've got their own apps as well. So the incumbents fought back and said, right, let's compete for convenience. Wherever you see friction in the economy, somebody in tech is looking at friction and saying that's an opportunity for tech to get in there and disrupt. But I think the key word here is friction. Are you holding onto an old vine which is built off friction? If so, get ready to jump off because that old vine is going to let go of you soon. And we saw that in the taxi wars. Let's go back to music for a moment before we get into the analogies with commercial real estate. There have been some critics, I'd say respectfully to Spotify and streaming, uh, among them Neil Young and uh, Taylor Swift have been pretty mm -hmm. vocal in their objection. Um, and then I'll give you another example. My favorite band of all time is Led Zeppelin. The reason why I like Led Zeppelin, other than their overall greatness, was how productive they were in the first 18 months of their career. They made that I band. know. Led Zeppelin one through four in 18 months. You then take a modern band like the Alabama Shakes, which I also love, and they've only produced two albums in their 10 plus years of existence. Isn't that a reflection of the change in the music business? that it is all about the next hit and streaming and not about the next album? Have we lost creativity because of streaming? No. Let's just go back to Led Zeppelin. They made Led Zeppelin 1, the actual record Led Zeppelin 1, in 48 hours. And I struggle to think of a rock song recorded today which has the same impact as Communication Breakdown to the genius of Jimmy Page and the other three members of the band. But I think what you've seen with streaming is, firstly, from the consumer's perspective, I think music's become more diverse. I think they're getting exposed to more. There's more seeds being sown and more of those seeds are taking root. On a creator side, I think what's really striking about this, and I'm pretty sure that you'll spot a parable with your sector here is when the barriers to entry fall, anybody can get onto Spotify. Supply exceeds demand. And that's the fascinating point. And I'll give you a couple of numbers to work with on this. In the 1980s, the British or the American music industry, take your pick, released about 6,000 albums. That was the entire supply side function of music. Today, the same quantity of music, let's call it 60,000 songs for the sake of simplicity, is being released every single day. That means tomorrow there's going to be a new 60,000 songs onboarded onto Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, competing for the 60,000 released today, and on and on and on. So... There is just so much more music. There's more subscribers, there's more money, but there's way more mouths to feed. And that supply exceeding demand point is a kind of a beautiful axiom to think for what else is happening in the economy. Give you a quick example. We're doing a podcast right now. Do you know that two new podcasts are being created every minute today? Every minute. So in the time that you asked me that question, four new podcasts, maybe six new podcasts have been onboarded onto Spotify and Apple. It's insane. Back to the core point, supply is exceeding demand when barriers to entry fall. I think the consumer is way better off with streaming than they were with buying the new form of the same album, whether it was from a vinyl record to uh, a tape to a CD, and now back to vinyl records once again. But a place where the consumer does not seem to be winning is in live music. And live music, the cost of going to a live show uh, is extraordinarily high. Why has live music maintained its pricing power while recorded music or stream music seems as though to have lost its pricing power? Scarcity and excludability. So in the start of my book, I simply draw a very easy to understand two by two matrix to ask the question, 
what good are you trading in? You can apply this to sheds and shops in your world. You can apply this to music in my world. And this two by two question revolves around, is the product you're making scarce or not? And is it excludable or not? Now, if we go back to the 90s, we have Tire Records in the US, was it excludable? Yes, there's a big, nasty looking security guard in Tire Records who forced you to pay. And was it scarce? Yes, if that's the last Eagle CD on the shelf and I can get it before Spencer, that means I win and you lose. It was a scarce item. Digital music has no scarcity. I can stream with 60 million songs today. They'll still be there tomorrow. And no excludability. You can go onto the internet and find whatever you want. You can pay for it on Spotify. You can probably find it for free on YouTube. There's no security guard there. Look at live music. A ticket is scarce and a ticket is excludable. So if you simply apply this two by two matrix, you can see how value migrates away from recorded music and towards live. And key transferable point here is live is scarce, live is excludable, value migrates to live. But that area has been disrupted as well. Nobody enjoys going to Ticketmaster um, to buy tickets. I compare it to going to your dentist to get root canal treatment. But you're seeing people disrupt their, that sector as well. And companies like Dice FM are kind of trying to be like the, the AWS of live music. Get rid of the legacy systems, get rid of that old vine of clumsy ticketing websites and excessive booking fees and replace it all with a nice slick app that's community-based as opposed to trying to take as much cream off the milk base that Ticketmaster does. So even that sector is experiencing disruption at pace. You talk at great length in your book, uh, Tarzan Economics, about emotion and the psychology of what attracts attention and encourages it to spread. I think this brings a great uh, segue into commercial real estate because when people look at bricks and mortar real estate as just a four walls to keep out the rain, they miss the point. The point of why do people go to restaurants? Why do people go to the office? Why do people go to hotels? They're not going there for four walls to keep out the rain. They're going there for a purpose and part of it's emotional. Do you see that same connection with what's happened with the music industry? Yes. Uh, I have this kind of working theory drummed up over many bottles of strong gassy lager, uh, not drummed up of only great philosopher, but I have this thing in my head, which is people are being attracted to two things the thrill of a bargain, the thrill of a luxury, but a complete disregard for what's in the middle. And I see it in music, and I'm seeing it in your world of retail and real estate as well. So in music, keeping it simple, £120 a year or £9.99 a month for a streaming service. Well, firstly, it's been 20 years since the £9.99 price point was invented. So it has to be cheaper now than it was back in 2002 when Rhapsody got its license. So it's a bargain. It's a straight up bargain. You can buy two loaves of bread at a posh bakery here in North London. It'll cost more than $9.99. We're saying $9.99 for 60 million songs for a month. It's a bargain. But it's the same people that are buying vinyl records for $25 a shop. And I truly believe that 90% of those vinyl records being sold today haven't even been opened, never mind played. Sorry to interrupt you, but I'm holding up a copy of the Eagles in the long run, which I purchased a month and a half ago out of nostalgia while I was in New Hope, Pennsylvania. So exhibit A to what you're saying. Well, we've got to follow this. I mean, music is a microcosm for so much more that's going around. So you bought the vinyl record. You probably listened to that vinyl record through Spotify or whatever streaming service you're using. You love the thrill of a bargain. 10 quid for every song in the world a month? Easy. You love the thrill of a luxury. Here, I've got my favorite Eagles record. Here on my pride of place, putting it on my mantelpiece so my friends can see it when I'm on my Zoom calls. But you have got no regard for stuff in the middle. And when you look at retail, I think something similar is happening. Low-end supermarkets are winning market share. Here in Britain, we have the German players like Aldi and Lidl coming in and stealing market share. High-end bakeries and butchers and fishmongers are winning market share because if you want to buy a good uh, leg of lamb, you'll pay a butcher to find the best leg of lamb. But going to the people in the middle, the Tesco's, the Sainsbury's, is becoming kind of you know unfavorable in the consumer. And I'm seeing it in aviation. Low-cost carriers, JetBlue in the US, who have done some amazing stuff during the pandemic, giving free flights to essential workers. They're winning market share. Emirates, Singapore Airlines at the top end of the market are winning market share. But if you look at Cathay Pacific or British Airways, not so good. I mean, British Airways used to be the world's favorite airline. Now it's the world's 19th favorite airline based on the current rankings. So again, I see in music and across commerce, this hauling out of the middle. People go to the extremes and they don't stick in the middle. I think you're missing one key point. Uh, it's not just cost. 
People aren't pure economic actors. They are emotional actors. That's why people buy luxury goods. But that's also why people go to restaurants and bars to have the same meal that they can make at their home. So talk a little bit further about how emotion might be the future of bricks and mortar real estate before we get to beyond retail to the others. I'm fond of saying that the internet can scale just about anything, but it cannot, it will not be able to scale intimacy. When you talk emotion, I'm thinking intimacy. Intimacy becomes the new currency that we're all chasing. You bring up what is maybe my favorite economist in the world, Richard Thaler, uh, in your book, and, and behavioral economics. Because I believe that behavioral economics is the key to the future of everything, not just real estate. Tell me how behavioral economics plays into some of your ideas in your book, Tarzan Economics. What behavioral economics did was essentially look down the psychology department corridor and said, is there any ideas here I can steal and dress it up as economics? That, in my opinion, is what behavioral economics is, and good on them. And I love that work, not just Richard Thaler, but Tversky, Kahneman, many others. The example I give in the book was a feature that many of your listeners who use Spotify will be familiar with, which is Discover Weekly. Very simply, Discover Weekly says, I want to give Spencer 30 songs every Monday created just for Spencer's taste. So all that sort of New York disco music that you love, YMCA and all those tracks, we know that, we have that in our data. So we're going to get you back to those New York discos in the 1970s every Monday with a playlist just for your taste. So we launched that. We've launched countless playlists which try to do something similar. But for some reason, Discover Weekly just exploded, whereas all other types of playlists failed. And this is told in a chapter of the book called Big Data, Big Mistakes. And that's an important expression, big data, big mistakes. Why? Because we had all this big data to look at why it's successful, but we couldn't find the reason why. We had skips. How many songs were skipped from Spencer's 30 song playlist? We had saves. How many of those songs did he save to his own commute to work playlist? We had shares. We had dwell time. We had time of day listening. Most common time to listen to your Discover Weekly was 4.15 on a Monday afternoon. Why? Because you pulled out all your meetings, you cleared out your calendar, and you just zone out to music to get you through the end of the first day of the week. We had all this big data, dashboards coming out of our ears, but we couldn't see the reason why. That took me to Chicago. That took me to Richard Thaler. I got to work with six of his students on his MBA course and explore reasons why. And truth be told, we couldn't find out. So had to go up in front of Richard Thaler, and he said to me, so what's the answer? I said, I'm sorry, Professor Thaler, but I don't have one. So let's go through some counterfactuals. What else have you tried and failed? So we tried Throwback Thursday playlists. That bombed. We tried Feel Good Friday playlists. That flopped as well. Nobody listened to it. Then he said, but you tried Discover Weekly on a Monday, and you're telling me that you got 40 million listeners listening to 40 million unique playlists, which is going to change media forever. I said, yes. I said, don't you see the reason why? I said, no, that's why I've come to Freezing Cold Chicago to ask you. He said, it's obvious. He said, it's because you did it on a Monday. All the behavioral economics research shows people are receptive to new things on a Monday that they wouldn't do any other day of the week. Something that's called the Fresh Start Initiative. As soon as he said that, Spencer, my mind went straight back to North London, the Kentish Town Tube Station on the Northern Line, and it's only Mondays when they promote gym membership. It always has been. It's only on Mondays where they promote a new yoga class or they launch a new newspaper. It's Mondays where people are receptive to new things. And that's a great example of behavioral economics spotting something that is intuitively obvious. To anyone who runs a gym, this is old news. But all the data scientists with PhDs couldn't spot the answer. I think that's a beautiful way of just trying to rebalance the addiction to big data with a little dose of common sense. Well, that's why most businesses that I've been involved with have our weekly meetings on Mondays. Uh, because that is that is something <laughs> figured out that Monday's a good day for it. But one thing that hasn't been figured out by my good friends at Spotify is why I have both Neil Diamond and Black Sabbath on my playlist and are trying to figure out what my actual preferences are. So uh, we'll work through that issue as well. I think we're struggling with your mood swings there. Must be. But let's go now to the office space, which is the area that's getting the most attention within commercial real estate uh, today because of work from home, because of Zoom. And I want to go to a quote that you have in your book from Peter Drucker. And the quote is, The customer rarely buys what the company thinks it is selling. So let me ask you, Will, coming out of a different industry, what do you think that we as office owners uh, are selling to our tenants? The intention might be to allow workspace for productivity to flourish. That is, how many people do you employ? 
you know, what's your head count? What's your requirements? Um, this is your floor space. You know, I think what we're going to see as we come out of lockdown is what you're actually selling as a place for culture to flourish. I'm kind of passionate on this point. Culture cannot flourish on Zoom calls. Culture cannot flourish on Teams meetings. Culture cannot flourish on Slack channels. I'm pretty sure you'll start to see casualties on the hard shoulder of the internet already appearing there as people start to realize just how valuable it is for me to sit with Spencer in a room at a meeting, then walk out with Spencer after that meeting and talk to him in his ear in the corridor about something I noticed in that meeting. That intimacy, back to that word intimacy, is priceless. You can't put a price on something that's priceless. So what you're going to be in the business of selling is a place for culture to flourish. So culture as space, and I guess how we make that space as inviting as possible to create that culture, the nature of what that space is, is changing in certain ways. And one of the ways that it's changing is there's a greater preference for flexibility to have some of the space that you have long term, so then you have short term. There's greater desire for outdoor amenities, for wellness. Um, there's also a greater a desire for uh, what people call differentiated product. So on this podcast, about a month and a half ago, we had senior executives from a big developer called Heinz. And they were talking about uh, buildings that they're building out of wood, office buildings, cross-laminated timber, which is sort of like going back to vinyl records and music. And why are they going back to wood? Because people are getting an emotional connection to the physical structure. They talked about people physically touching the building, much as I'm physically touching my Eagles Amazing. record today. That's inspirational. I often cite the Danes. The way that they tackle design is just phenomenal. When you go to Copenhagen International Airport, they have a polished wooden floor. Now, I don't do design. You know, partly I'm colorblind, so I can't appreciate design as well as I should. But to see a polished wooden floor in an airport, you know what? I don't mind that my flight's delayed for two hours. I'll sit in this lovely space with a polished wooden floor and read a book instead. No great shakes. It feels like a library. You give me a Heathrow standard floor, this gets me in a bad mood. Small nuanced differences in design can have a huge impact. And again, I, I stress, I'm not a designer at heart, but Spotify had this lovely way of having themes, be it color, fabric themes in our offices. So no matter where you traveled in the world, you felt you were at home at Spotify. So I fly to San Francisco. I walk into the office. It's like, yeah, I recognize this furniture. It's not identical to what I'm used to, but it's got a theme, a recurring theme to it. I might be lacking sleep. I might be feeling rotten but I actually feel at home in this office and I can execute this piece of work. That doesn't come from a sort of stack and high selling cheap mentality. Those days are over. That's an old one. You've got to let go of that. This comes from much more nuanced culture. So what we're selling now is that. Let's go big picture for a moment here. Mm -hmm. Where can we apply Tarzan economics beyond the business context? And one thing that you mention in your book is climate change is, is how do we tackle that? Mm. Um, and you express that climate change is the classic common good or the tragedy of the commons. But does Tarzan economics teach us any lessons that may allow us to tackle that big problem? Yeah, I think uh, building off what I said last, what often happens is what matters most is being measured least. And we can measure productivity, but we don't measure the cost of that productivity. Things such as the climate are hard to measure things. Things such as gridlock because of legal complexity are hard to measure what might have happened. We don't do a good job of measuring counterfactuals. So I think weaning ourselves off the addiction to this thing called gross domestic product, this metric that we base election results upon, this metric that we base the performance of our central banks on, I think that would be a good start because the gross domestic product was not there to measure the impact of the climate. And in fact, if you go back to the origins of gross domestic product or GDP for short, Simon Kuznets, who invented it in 1939, the original premise was a great measure to gauge the country's ability to go to war. Guns and butter. I can give you more guns or I can give you more butter, but I can't give you both. That was the kind of origins of GDP. That was 1939. Here we are in 2021 and we're still addicted to this measure when there's so much more that matters. So back to that key mantra of what matters most is being measured least. And I think a good start to understand things such as the climate change, and particularly in the world of sheds and shops that you're in, the impact of what your business is doing with the climate, positive and negative, would be to wean ourselves off traditional metrics like GDP. Well, interesting. I had several debates on GDP versus standard of living. Is standard of living the right index? Standard of living can help, but how on earth do you normalize and measure that without invading people's privacy is my gut reaction to that one. 
Um, I'll give you one that I think that has some merit and it's, it's featured in my book. It's a very briefly a story about the chief economist at the Bank of England, a chap called Andy Haldane, a very, very bright, novel, maverick, original thinking economist. And he said he wanted to use Spotify data to predict the next recession. Huge PR like issues with this. You know, is Spotify giving our central bank private data? Is Spotify going to increase the cost of our mortgages? You can forget Neil Young and Taylor Swift complaining about us. Every person in the country would be complaining about interest rates going up because of Spotify at this rate. None of it was true. Nobody was trading data. It was just a flippant remark by the bank. But we got him to explain himself. He said, well, here's how I look at the world. As it currently stands, and this is 2018, I think because of the Brexit negotiations, which weren't going well at this point, anxiety is a bigger issue. I'm more worried about anxiety amongst the consumers than I am about manufacturing orders based on survey recall evidence. And I'll look wherever I can for signals about anxiety before I set interest rates, as opposed to trucking a survey around a manufacturing plant. And we just fell in love with it. What a beautiful thing for a central bank chief economist to say. Why can't we have more people thinking like that? Back then, all the Europeans living in Britain didn't know whether they would continue living here. They were nervous, and they had mortgages, and they spent money, and they're driving your business of logistics and sheds and shops alike. There was anxiety in the economy. Now, you could have a PhD in economics, but you don't have a PhD in understanding anxiety. That's a different discipline. That's a different vine. Well, I will tell you how to predict uh, when the next recession is going to come is when my playlist includes more Johnny Cash and Olivia Newton-John's Have You Ever Been to Mellow? Because those are my happy places. Uh, that's when I'm nervous. I listen to those. Uh... Spencer, here's a cash prize question for you, sir. Um, March the 13th was an important day for two reasons. One, it's my birthday. And two, it's when Donald Trump locked down America last year. What was the most streamed song on Spotify on March the 13th last year? Oh, boy. I'm going to take a wild guess and I'm going to be wildly wrong. But I'm going to go with something more along the lines of uh, some kind of lovey, making you feel good kind of song. No, it was R.E.M.'s famous hit, It's the End of the World as We Know It, and I Feel Fine. <laughs> there you go. Signals of anxiety that you wouldn't find in manufacturing orders. You understand my point? I mean, it's I a joke because it actually is true, but it's very relevant to saying, you know, what matters most is being measured least. We've got to tattoo that on our foreheads because, you know, we get a wash of all this data thinking that's telling us what's going on. It's got nothing to do with what's going on. Get to the humans, get to the emotion get to the intimacy and try and understand that instead. I'm with you there. So Bitcoin is obviously a classic example of a disruptor. Um, and uh, I'm going to take the counterpoint here. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I am going to say, however, that there's a reason why we have a financial system with national governments with money. And there's a reason why we have wires that are traceable. And I think a lot of that shows up in the form of uh, some of the very negative events we're seeing today with uh, hacking and holding people ransom and using Bitcoin as the tool to be able to do so. So are there downsides uh, to disruption? Yeah, I think there's going to be some casualties in this Bitcoin journey that we're currently on. But I do think you have to look at the old vine and say, was it really that good in the first place? So when people dismiss Bitcoin, when people dismiss some of the fintech advancements that we're seeing, why are you dismissing it? Are you a turkey voting for Christmas because you've got a vested stake in the current banking model? Now, I think there is something big happening in payments, which acts as a parable for your sector, which is, I'm going to call it the cost of legacy systems. Um, I'll give you one very quick example. In terms of ID identification, is Spencer Levy, Spencer Levy? Simple question. How long would it take me to work that out? Now, if you were to set up with, let's say, I'll use a UK high street bank, I won't name any names, a business bank account, okay? I would expect around two months of paperwork before we've actually got that bank actually up and running and your business is operational. There are companies coming, especially out of London, which is a fintech hub in the area of ID. I'll name one, iProof, fascinating company, which are reducing the time it takes to start up a bank to 20 minutes, thanks to modern innovation in ID recognition. That's incredible. That's a new vine we're swinging out onto. So you have to wonder, like the whole financial system, how much of that financial system is holding onto the old vine? How many of those tower blocks in Canary Wharf here in London and those skyscrapers in Manhattan will be needed when we come out of lockdown? Versus a new vine in FinTech, which is coming out of warehouses with no legacy systems to hold it back. And I'm really interested in that as a transferable theme across all of industry, which is 
When is it the legacy systems, which mean you can't let go? And if you can't let go because of that, then you really are screwed. So there will be casualties because of that too. Let me end this conversation where you begin your book. You begin your book talking about how to make it safer to swim. And you talk about that you could make it safer to swim if you force people to swim. You force them to take lessons. You force them into the water. But then you quickly realize that that actually would be more dangerous than letting people make their own choices because you would force too many people into the water causing more unfortunate outcomes. How do your lessons learned from swimming apply to us today? You're citing the first lesson in economics my father a math teacher ever taught me. And I was 11 years old when he taught me that. He simply said, let's imagine you're the prime minister. Let's imagine I'm you're faced with this terrible situation of kids drowning in British beaches. And you're going to walk out at number 10 and give them your policy response. Like you say, I came up with make swimming compulsory. That will stop the kids drowning. But he walked me through the problem that you're trying to solve. And the problem is that kids who can't swim don't go into water. So if I make swimming compulsory, more kids will go into water. And if there's more kids in water and 0.01% of them drown fatally, I'll have more deaths, not less, as a result of my policy. My best intentions made the problem worse. Now, bringing it full circle to where we started, you know, talking about the origins of music piracy, I told that story to the general counsel of the Performing Rights Society when I first started in the music industry back in 2006. How did you get into economics, Will? And I told the story that we've just told now. You know what the lawyer said to me? What did he say? She said, I just ban the kids from swimming. (laughs) That's one way to handle it. Ban the kids from stealing music. You can't ban the kids from swimming. You can't ban the kids from stealing music. You need to build something that's better. You know, build safer beaches, build a flag system, build information about which where the currents are. You know, tell the kids when the water is too dangerous to go into as opposed to them finding out themselves when they're 10 meters into the deep water. Information can help improve the experience. Work with the problem, don't work against it. Great, well, on behalf of The Weekly Take, I am thrilled to have Will Page here, the author of Tarzan Economics, Spotify Economists. Uh, Will, thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you, it's been a real pleasure to be interviewed by you, Spencer. I love your show too. Music to my ears. We once again thank Will Page for joining us and thank you as well for tuning in. For more on Will and our show, check out cbre.com slash the weekly take. Drop us a note with your feedback. Whether you stream the show on Spotify, a company Will Page to help build, or on Apple Podcasts, Google, or another platform, please make sure to subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you listen. We'll keep on rocking throughout the summer with our annual mid year outlook coming up next week, and more hits on the horizon. For now, I'm Spencer Levy. Be smart, be safe, be well, and rock on.